We are now ready for chapter five, and we're going to be talking a lot about polynomials, polynomial functions, and so let's just get right into it. This is a very foundational lesson. Uh, first of all, uh, we want to be able to identify a polynomial, whether or not a function is a polynomial function, and if it is, uh, how do we tell what the degree, because the degree is important information about uh, graphing later on. Uh, we will be using uh, transformation principles uh, to do some graphs, and we'll be identifying real zeros. What does that mean of a polynomial function, and what is this idea of multiplicity? So uh, let's just get right into it. Uh, the first block of problems, pretty simple, really. Um, your answer is going to be yes or no to whether or not the function is a polynomial function. And I've identified really two main ways that you can tell. Uh, check out the exponents. They have to be non-negative integers, or in other words, positive. And if you're not sure, uh, maybe it's been a while since you've heard about this uh, term integers. Well, integers are just basically, we're talking about positive whole numbers. One, two, three, uh, no fractions, and obviously they have to be positive. Okay, so those uh, have to be the exponents in order for it to qualify as a polynomial. And then this other idea, the domain is, the, is all real numbers. So I cannot input anything other than a real number. And uh, what that means is sometimes we end up with a variable, uh, for example, in the denominator. And that would really go back to this first point that exponents have to be non-negative. If I have x in the denominator, that means that it must have been raised to the negative one power. And so obviously that doesn't qualify. And uh, looking at it in another way, uh, the domain can't be all real numbers because I can't divide by zero, for example. So zero could not be uh, part of the domain. Therefore, all real numbers will not be part of the domain or will not describe the domain. So uh, that's what we're going to be looking at. So let's look at some odd problems, and you'll be doing the even ones in this block. So number 17, um, I notice that the exponent for x is a positive integer. I notice that um, I've got a real number down here in the denominator, so I don't have to worry about division by zero. Any number I want, any real number I want, can be an input. So for number 17, uh, the answer would be yes. It is a polynomial. And then uh, the degree will be the follow-up answer, and the degree will be whatever the largest exponent for x is. So if you have more than one x, you just take the largest exponent. If you should happen to have a monomial uh, like this, that's a multiplication of several different variables, then you would just add up the exponents. So in this case, in our problem, the degree is 2. In this little example down here, the degree would be 5, 3 plus 1 plus 1. Don't think you'll have to deal with this much, but I just wanted you to be aware of uh, how you can tell what the degree of a polynomial is. So you're going to be basically looking for the largest exponent for whatever the variable is in your problem. All right, so for number 19, um, two different ways of looking at this. Uh, x cannot be all real numbers because x can't be zero. So this does not qualify. So you've really got two ways of saying why. Uh, the domain is not all real numbers. That's a reason. reason. Not all real numbers. And uh, another way of writing this is, like we said earlier, uh, this is x to the negative one power, so the exponent is not a non-negative integer. So either one of those reasonings would be okay. Just write it out for you. Okay, so that's uh, what you'll be doing. Uh, number 21, um, it's all about this. This is not a non-negative integer. Three halves is not an integer. Cannot be a fraction to be in the set of integers. So my answer here is going to be no. Uh, exponent, not a non-negative integer. Okay, 
And then uh, for number 25, uh, this would be yes, it is a polynomial because my exponents are positive integers. Uh, you do have to be careful, however, uh, to get the degree. Oh, uh, we didn't have to worry about the degree on these because they're no. But if the answer is yes, uh, then we have to state the degree. So uh, to get the degree, we really should look at this in what would be called standard form. So I'm not going to say that you have to multiply all this out, but you should be able to tell that if I did square this first binomial, I would get x squared as the lead term, and this already has x squared. And so eventually, to, to expand all of this into what we would call standard form, I would have to multiply these together, and that would create x to the fourth. So you got to be careful. You might just... Uh, your your first reaction might just be to say that the degree is 2. Well, you really can't tell that until you get to what we call standard form. Then you look for the largest exponent for x. And in this case, the degree is going to be 4. All right, so be careful uh, in problems like this when it comes to stating the degree. Okay, so the only other part, uh, well, there's really three parts. Part 2 of this lesson, you'll be doing some graphing. And we've talked about this in the past, so this is a review of using transformations. We're going to take what is known as a parent function, and then we're going to move it or stretch it or compress it uh, based on what we're told in the function. So let me introduce you. We haven't really looked at this parent, uh, the parent y equals x to the fourth power. So anytime you want to... Uh, do a graph of a transformation of y equals x to the fourth, you can always start with these points. Obviously, if you input zero, you'll output zero. Input one, output one. And then that's also true for negative one. So really, uh, what hap what's going to happen here is this is going to be a skinnier version of y equals x squared. We're, we're really familiar with that parent. This is just going to be uh, a little skinnier version of that because um, when I input for when this was y equals x squared, if I input 2, I get output 4. Well, for this, if I input 2, I get output 16. Okay, so you can tell that it's just going to be a real narrow version. I've even done my y-axis in 2s just so I could fit all of these points. But if you want a starting place... For the parent y equals x to the fourth, you could just plot these points. And you don't have to draw the whole curve. But what we're going to do is, based on this, we're going to shift. Remember, inside the parentheses, that indicates a horizontal move. And it's a horizontal movement is always the opposite of the way it looks. This is actually moving the graph of this parent one unit to the left. Okay, So every point on the parent goes to the left one unit. And I'll just, so here's my uh, origin point, goes left one, left one, left one. Every single point that I drew for the parent goes left one. And that's really the only thing that you have to draw. But some people like to at least plot the points for the parent. You don't have to draw the whole curve. And then you can see how to move those points based on the function. So that would be my answer for a homework problem like number 27. All right, uh, let's try another one, uh, x to the fifth. Here's a general rule. Um, you, we talked about this in algebra two, but it's been a while. If the lead coefficient of the polynomial is positive, then the function is gonna go up on the right side and if the degree is odd, which it is here, it's going to go down on the left. So anytime you have an odd degree function and you're wanting a general idea of what the graph looks like, uh, it should be going up forever on the right and down forever on the left. And that's what happens with this. So let's just get an idea of the parent y equals x to the fifth. Uh, much like the other one, input 0, output 0, input 1, output 1 input negative 1, output negative 1. That's where it gets different. When it was an even degree, when I input negative numbers, it gave me a positive result. Okay, and so uh, we can, 
I, if I input 2, I'm going to get 32. That's just way up here, and negative 2, negative 32. So in general, this x to the fifth parent is going to look like this. It's just a real skinny-looking S, S kind of shape. All right, and the movement, I've already written it out here for you. Since it's not in parentheses, that always indicates a vertical shift. So in this case, every point on the parent is going to go three units down. So just take your parent points. Again, if you don't actually sketch out the whole parent, you just want to plot the points, that is, that's fine with me. Um, and you don't have to worry about this one that's way up here. We'll just do a rough sketch. But I should be able to tell that you have shifted this entire parent graph three units down. Okay, and it doesn't have, again, that probably would stretch out a little bit more like this, but it doesn't have to be anything exact, but the concept is really what I'm trying to get across here. If you add or subtract inside parentheses, or if it's under the radical, if it's inside absolute value, that's always a horizontal shift, opposite of the way it looks. If it's not contained in parentheses or if it's outside the radical or outside absolute value, it's always a vertical shift. And the great thing about vertical is it's not tricky. Down mean, or negative means down, <coughs> positive means up. Okay, here's another version. This is a transformation of that same parent, but this time with the negative sign, we've, we've talked about this with parabolas, the negative in front of the quadratic coefficient turns my upright parabola and makes it upside down. And so the deal with this, if I make this negative, it just takes this original parent that did this and it makes it do this direction. This is called a reflection. Okay, so it took my original parent and it's like you pick this, or the original parent, and I can show it like this, it was doing this kind of thing. So we take this and rotate it. If you rotate it forward, if you can visualize that, flip it, turn it over the x-axis, it takes this arrow and makes it become down here. So that's called a, a reflection. And anytime we put a negative in front, it reflects on the x-axis. Okay, so that's your number 33. And then uh, number 35, um, you get that same idea. It's that same parent, the real skinny looking S. But according to this, we're going to take all of these parent points, so we're going to move them one to the right and then two up. And so I'll let you finish that. Inside is horizontal, opposite. Outside is vertical, not tricky. Okay, so every one of these points, and you can just use these same ones, you're going to go right one, up two, and then make your curve. Okay, I think you get the idea. Um, the only thing I would say on this is... This number that we have here is uh, when we multiply by a number that's not a fraction, it, it does what we call vertical stretch. All right, so you can start with those same parent points. We'll just use these three. And multiplying by two means you're just multiplying the y coordinate of these points by two. Okay, we've done this in the past with our square root parent. So, for example, um, the y coordinate here, of course, is 0. 0 times 2 is still 0. So multiplying by 2 for this point really doesn't have any effect. Now I'm going to do the left one, up one, and I'm going to put a little red dot. They're going to temporarily share that space. So that's your, that's your order. You take the y coordinate. Let's move to this one. The y coordinate on the parent, that's negative 1. But when I multiply by 2, it makes negative 1, or yeah, positive 1 become negative 2. Okay, you see how that works? You're only multiplying this number by the y coordinate of the parent. Okay, and uh, if we did plot negative 2, 32 for the parent, 
it would make this negative to negative 64 after multiplying by 2. So you only, this multiplies only by the y coordinate. All right, so same thing here. The y coordinate of the parent is positive 1. But when I multiply by 2, I'm multiplying by negative 2. I don't know why I did that. I was thinking about the other problem. This makes this positive 2. I'm sorry about that. I'm trying to rush through this video. So uh, I don't know why I was thinking negative 2. That's, that would flip it over. So y coordinate, which is 1 times 2. And then you do the shift. Okay, so after I multiplied by 2, I'm going to go left 1 and up 1. Okay, so this parent, this point right here, I multiplied it by 2, and then I go left 1, up 1. Okay, this point got multiplied by 2, which moved it here, and then I'm going to go left 1, up 1. The original origin point, when we already said when we multiply that by 2, 2 times 0 doesn't change it, so I'm going to go left 1, up 1, and then that's right there. And then this will be the rough sketch. of our transformed parent. Okay, hope that didn't confuse you. Sorry, I don't know why I was multiplying by negative 2, but um, I guess that's a good lesson. If this is negative, again, you're only multiplying the y-coordinate. y-coordinate times this. If it were negative, then it would cause it to reflect, flip over. Okay, so uh, we're almost done. Uh, the last set of problems, the directions look like this. You're going to form a polynomial function whose real zeros and degree are given. A zero of a function means that when we plug that number in for x, it causes zero. So here's what you can think about. Uh, think about a binomial that contains x, where if I did plug negative 1 in for x, it would create zero. Well, that binomial would have to be x plus 1, okay? Doesn't it make sense that if you put negative 1 in place of x and add these together, you're going to get 0, okay? I need another binomial for this one, and that one's going to have to be x minus 1. When I put these numbers in for x into a binomial, they should create 0. That's where we get the term. It is a 0 of a function. And then finally, uh, this one would be x minus 3, okay? Now uh, the, the hard work begins. We need to multiply these together. So let's put two of these together. Doesn't matter how you group them. And we're going to do FOIL. So minus 3 minus 1 is minus 4x plus 3. And now we're going to multiply by this other binomial x plus 1. So distribute x to each one of these. And then distribute 1 to each one of these. And then uh, combine like terms, and you will be done. So minus 4 plus 1 is minus 3. x squared, 3 minus 4 is negative 1x, and then plus 3. So this is the polynomial in standard form that was created from these three zeros, and it does have a degree of 3 because 3 is the largest exponent for x. Okay, those are not too bad. And uh, let's try one more. We have zeros of negative 1. When you see this word multiplicity, that just means that negative 1 is only used one time. But if you notice, it says 3 has a multiplicity of 2, so that means that I'm going to use the number 3 as a 0 twice. Okay, multiplicity, again, just means that it's, it's a number that's used as a 0 more than once. Multiplicity 1, negative 1 will be used once. 3 has a multiplicity of 2, so it's going to be used twice. And now we're back to what we were doing before doesn't really matter how you group these. I went ahead and multiplied these together. And now we'll distribute x. And distribute 1.
combine like terms. And that's it. That's our polynomial. And it has a degree of 3. It's in standard form, which means my highest exponent for x is first. And then I just count down in order until I get to a constant. So that's how these work. Uh, pretty easy. And uh, that's, that's all you're going to have to do. The assignment uh, for the homework will be tomorrow. So for today, I just want you to watch these notes. If something about the notes doesn't make sense, you're welcome to email me. If I need to uh, uh, do something else, I'll be glad to. Just uh, let me know if you have any questions, and I'll talk to you later.